Hello, my name is Nicholas Allen, and as director of the Wilson Center for Humanities and Arts at the University of Georgia, I am involved in the Coasts, Climates, Humanities and the Environment Consortium, which is funded by a pilot grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, for which we are all very grateful. The Mellon Foundation support has enabled researchers from the University of Georgia, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, the University of Florida, and Louisiana State University to build a series of site-specific and publicly engaged research projects in coastal places, which look at questions of climate breakdown, community alliance in face of historical and contemporary marginalization, and the capacity of the humanities to imagine the futures of places under threat from storms and sea level rise. Our site-specific research has been interrupted, like everything else, by the pandemic. One of our aims is to create a series of online masterclasses on the subject of coastal studies. And given this is something we can do remotely now, I have asked a number of friends to take part in a series of conversations that we will share online. Some of these will be broader conversations about the coast as a site of study and the diverse approaches evolving to engage with it. And some, like today, will be anchored in specific subjects connected to the consortium. Joining me now are three colleagues and friends from our consortium with three very different practices and perspectives. Melinda Lowry, Terry Harpold, and Craig Colton are connected by their deep interest in coasts, in communities, and in water. They have been great supporters of this collaboration from the beginning, and I appreciate their taking the time to be with us today and to share their perspectives on coastal studies in this era of climate breakdown. Beginning with Melinda, and moving to Terry and Cray in turn, I'm going to ask a series of short questions with time for some discussion after. After watching this, if you have questions of your own for any of us, please do email me and we will try to continue the dialogue as the consortium moves forward. So Melinda, greetings. Hello, how are you? Your scholarship, creativity and activism has deep roots in the community and place from which you come and of which, about which you've written so beautifully and well. And I wanted to start by asking you, how has thinking about the zones between water and land changed your perceptions of literature, of history, and of place? Well, I'm a member of the Lumbee Tribe of North Carolina, uh, which is headquartered in southeastern North Carolina, a very much riverine landscape, but we think of it as, as the swamp. And so when we say we're on the swamp or home, home on the swamp, that's a specific reference point that feels as much historical and cultural as it does physical or ecological. Um, as many people know, the her her recent hurricanes, Florence and Matthew in particular, have flooded our homeland and in some ways restored the, the boundaries between water and land to what they were maybe 200 or 300 years ago. Um, so recent events have made me look at our landscape in a completely different way um, because I can imagine, not in a, not necessarily a happy circumstance, of course this has destroyed many homes and ruined um, economies that were already fragile and communities that were struggling. But when I look at some of the, especially the drone footage above um, the Lumber River, which is our or kind of corridor in southeastern North Carolina, I can see where places where the water used to run and places that my ancestors probably regarded as water are now land uh, because of swamp drainage to produce wider swaths of land for agriculture, especially industrial agriculture. Those drainage efforts started in the mid 19th century and continued up until the mid 20th century. Now many people wonder whether um, not taking care of those canals is part of the reason for the flooding that we're experiencing now. But um, having a kind of new visual reference point for what water can do and be in my homeland has meant a different kind of connection to the past. And then of course it begs certain sorts of questions about the future. So if this is what the water does with the profound respect for water that hurricane flooding forces you to have, <laughs> if this is what the water does in its natural state, then what are we as humans supposed to do? Um, 
And in thinking of that, it reminds me also of a wonderful Native American poet who has unfortunately passed on, John Trudell, who was an American Indian movement activist and musician. Um, he has said multiple times that Mother Earth will drive us to extinction before we drive her to extinction. And that sense of um, deep truth or the, the deep way that that resonates with me having a relationship to swamp landscapes and kind of part land, part water landscapes um, has a whole new meaning after seeing flooding and imagining what our futures should look like. So it's made climate change as an issue particularly urgent um, for me and for members of our community. And Melinda, when you think back into that historical presence and that long sense of community attached to these in-between riverine spaces, which are perhaps always have been part land, part water, have you and yourself begun to think in your own vision of this changing past and this uncertain future, become to just your own language and how you represent these places? I've been thinking a lot recently about these different kind of um, a grammar of water that could both incorporate both all these miniature changes, but also this larger scale over time about which we're thinking. Have you begun to think in a more watery fashion as you've also begun to admit water to your sense of culture and community? Well, yes, in a way. I think um, it's certainly forced me to reckon with water as part of a landscape. Um, I'm just not a, I'm not a geographer, so I don't possess necessarily the, the sophisticated language that they do to talk about land or places in such a variety of ways. But as a historian who takes place seriously and who has always used maps, for example, to understand uh, human decision making and cultural, uh, cultural change, I think being able to observe the swelling and and uh, reducing of our river following these hurricanes um, has encouraged me to to locate I suppose communities in closer relationship to to water and I think about this and sort of the trope that we associate with with Native American people in our society that were so connected to the land <laughs> is phenomenally kind of inaccurate when you think about the fact that our land is, is um, completely, it's water. Um, and that our, our land is not only subsumed by water, but that it's, um, we as people as, as, um, as connected to our past are also water. So I'm not yet there with the language, but I think I'm beginning to make connections that I, I couldn't before. Yeah, I've noticed in some of the literary criticism talking about hydrocolonialism, especially in mm. an African context, and also the idea of hydroscapes. Mm. And uh, I found those ideas powerful in my own writing, but it seems also provocative in these contexts. Now, Melinda, also, were these landscapes and seascapes that you're thinking about, these rivers, are marked deeply by the history of 19th, 20th, and even 21st century industrialization uh, of late capital, whether it's through climate breakdown and hurricanes, or whether it's through these canal systems and these reclamations, as they're called, of the land. And I wonder, in knowing this territory, this place, and um, this swamp land, and these rivers, so intimately and well, has it given you a different perspective also of this sort of um, history of capital when you're looking at these landscapes? Do you also see them with a different history in it too? Yes, well, one of the things I see is, is the greater uh, disease that I suppose capitalism, or rather the virus that capitalism is the disease that uh, manifested. So our coronavirus moment that we're in produces a disease called COVID-19. Greed is a virus that produces a disease called capitalism. And the ripple effects of capital and the way it's wielded specifically towards the uh, property interests of people who already possess a lot of property and who are more interested in hoarding it than sharing it 
um, has fundamentally altered indigenous people's ability to maintain their sovereign relationships to their places. And so it hasn't destroyed or eroded particularly those claims, but it's made, us, made it much more difficult for us to assert and assert those claims and challenge them amid things like a third phenomenon which is happening um, on our land, the, the progression of the Atlantic Coast Pipeline from the West Virginia mountains down into Eastern North Carolina, which has its terminus currently located in Robeson County, where the just, you know, just yards, essentially, <laughs> just a few hundred feet from the, from a crossroads that is the location of one of our core most historic American Indian communities that, ex that was, uh, you know, we know has been continuously occupied for thousands of years. So the idea of the Atlantic Coast Pipeline extending that deeply um, facilitated by capital and understandings of ownership that are driven by hoarding rather than redistribution. Um, I see that now not only as having a kind of environmental effect, but as having hopefully a positive effect in the way we think about how we as Americans em embrace capital and wealth. Um, I think essentially when you look at the Atlantic Coast Pipeline and its construction literally amid hurricane recovery efforts, as well as efforts to mitigate the spread of a deeply contagious virus, there's, a, you can no longer see these things in isolation. You see how they're all related. And in particular, the, the silo of activism that surrounds um, these endeavors and their impacts, people need to begin working together in a whole different way. So whereas the Atlantic Coast Pipeline might have primarily drawn opposition from folks who were against fracking and who were interested in the preservation of um, hydrologic systems or other, um, you know, other, other impacts of methane gas, we see that folks that want to preserve cultural heritage landscapes are deeply interested in the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. We see where people who are deeply invested in the value of their own land mm -hmm. uh, are opposing the Atlantic Coast Pipeline because of, of the way in which this giant corporation wishes to divest landowners of the, their property worth by, by um, forcing eminent domain over parts of their property. So, you know, what might have been a virus that turned into a disease, greed that turned into capitalism, you see something like the Atlantic Coast Pipeline progressing and it forces folks who accepted those narratives into rethinking their narratives about the relationship between how they wield capitalism and how the environment is, um, is to human beings. So Melinda, before I move on to Terry, um, one of the other reasons that we're all here is to hear each of our stories, but to share them and to wonder a little like in that moment you've just described how in sharing them we might amplify and create and evolve and change some of the ways that we think about coastal and estuarial and riverine places. And just as, if not more importantly, the human communities that live upon them, many of them have not been represented in ways that are adequate. So I just, before we move to Terry, I wonder, could you speak a little about the projects that you've been involved with in UNC and if you had anything briefly to say about the power, as you see it, of bringing these institutions together to think about these coastal places? Yes, I mean, the, the opportunities that we have with this consortium are to, you know, first of all, reveal models of engagement to one another in a much more immediate sense that were not previously available. So when I first heard about Craig's work, for example, I, it just, it propelled me further to um, invest some of our resources at UNC in partnerships with graduate students, with uh, community members like the Lumber River Keeper, um, someone who works with the North Carolina Watershed Alliance, 
uh, people like Ryan Emanuel, who has such a deep expertise in um, the relevant effects of all of these movements and sees them as integrated. Um, so what we have decided to do is, is fund a kind of pilot project that uses a method called photo voice, which is quite common in the social sciences and the health sciences, to solicit um, a community engagement around the impacts of flooding. And immediately those folks also start talking about the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. They also are gonna be talking about COVID. And they're also going to be talking about the disproportionate impacts of these events on communities that are already struggling. And what one of our researchers is finding is that people combat that sense of uncertainty with an enormous, um, an enormous appreciation for their history. So we, we talk sometimes about history as a burden that we must carry, but I think black and indigenous people in Robinson County who have been adversely affected by flooding don't see history as a burden. They see it as a fundamental necessary tool, a gift that when we know it, we can use it to address the circumstances before, before us. And it means that we're not you know, simply hopeless or 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 um, victims in the face of an immense degree of power. So being able to just participate and observe that as kind of members of academic communities is phenomenal because, you know, of course, most of our research methods are really driven by conversations that are not like that. <laughs> we don't hear them. We don't hear those voices very much in the typical research methods that we're accustomed to. So um, being able to bring forward, you know, approaches to engagement among, among ourselves and then use that as inspiration to, um, to further community concerns is, is a fundamental reason why Chapel Hill is at the table and, and we're grateful for it. Well, thank you, Melinda. I've always learned a great deal for you. I look forward to learning more in the future. I do thank appreciate you. your good company. So, Terry, there you are, 20,000 leagues under the sea. <laughs> and uh, your research has been focused more from your home in the University of Florida. And I wanted to begin to ask you, you're a wonderful literary scholar and a great member of your intellectual and your public community in the state of Florida. And just would you talk a little bit about how important is the coast to your work as a site of study and why? Well, you know, again, thank you. Thank you for uh, making me a part of not only the consortium, but this, this wonderful conversation. You know, a few of us have experiences of truly open water, right? We envision um, what's called the offing, the distance part of the open sea is seen from the shore. And as you know, Nicholas, that's an important figure in Seamus Haney's poetry, the offing. So we see the sea from the fringe of the land and water that we call the shore. So estuaries, near shore, foreshore, backshore, those are dynamic changeable zones. They change according to the rhythms of the tide in extremis during surges and storms. And then they change cumulatively over time, the kind of timelines that Melinda was talking about. So, um, you know, in the late Anthropocene, the fringe is going to become perhaps even more than in the past, a principal zone in which the imaginaries of land and water are conjoined. And, and I'm interested in the shore in that regard, the way in which it transforms this fringe. We, we have to get beyond the conventional vision of the shore as a border or an edge. That's geographical thinking, but it's not hydrological and certainly not literary or poetic thinking. So I, I, recently I've become very interested in the ways in which the shore opens to a kind of, a, a, groups of or, or classes of unbounded phenomena that that press in on it um so you know we worry very deeply about menacing versions of the of the formless that abut on the shore hypoxic dead zones oil spills red tides algal jellyfish blooms all of this sort of thing and then they come further inland they they fill estuaries they clot them with sludge and silt and those are real those are biologically dangerous phenomena to be sure, but they're also freighted with a lot of affective significance. And I think that that can be transformative. You know, they, they, they wash up 
on onto the shore and they kind of arouse a kind of disgust, anxiety, and sometimes aspiration. So um, I would say that the area that I'm working in terms of literary studies is, is, is wrapped increasingly around the idea that the imaginary of climate change is about these encounters with what the French philosopher Georges Bataille calls the formless, kind of obstinate, unthinkable materiality that, that pushes against distinctions between figure and ground and it, it collapses hierarchies. So, so images of that formless thing that comes in and disrupts firmly defined hierarchies, they're all over a genre that I work in that's called climate fiction. That's a branch of science fiction that's concerned with the effects of climate change and the long-term consequences of anthropogenic global warming. So you see these figures of the, the, these vast spectacles of formlessness coming in and dissolving hierarchies. It's all over the place, right? It's in um, the depictions of London as a post-anthropocene morass in Richard Jeffries, the great British naturalist, uh, Richard Jeffries is after London, I think that's 1885. You see it in J.G. Ballard's The Drowned World, um, that's 62. Um, the French author Jean-Marc Ligny has a, a wonderful novel in which there's a, an episode involving a post-climate change Dunkirk that's sur submerged under a churning soup of jellyfish. Um, and then the American author Claire Bay Watkins uh, has a, a novel called Gold Fame Citrus in which a vast inland sea, a desert sea, uh, swallows the American West. So those are all anxiety-laden images of this formlessness. I don't think that the literature of formlessness um, is limited to anxiety. I think it's also a potential for transformative thinking outside of firm hierarchies and kind of liberating exploration, uh, particularly in a post-anthropic mode. Um, one of, one of the, my favorite texts for teaching undergraduates this idea is an essay by John Muir written in 1867 um, there's a long backstory, but essentially he took a two-month walking trip uh, from Kentucky to Florida. He wanted to board a ship to take him to Cuba, and then he was going to go to South America. This was 1867. He passed through Gainesville, uh, very close to where I am right now, um, in, in mid-October. And then he reached the uh, Gulf of Mexico at Cedar Key, um, about 60 miles further um, on the Gulf Coast in October 23rd. Um, he was going to spend a few weeks working in a sawmill planning to get some money so he could take this trip. And then he got, he got typhoid and malaria and had a forced three month uh, recuperation. Um, now, Cedar Key reminded him of his birthplace in Dunbar, East Lothian, East Lothian in Scotland. Uh, it's a small, it was a bigger town there. It's then it's a kind of a small town here. Um, my, my wonderful colleague at UF, Ken Sassaman, who's a member of our consortium, is working on an archaeological dig there at Cedar Key on what's called at Sina Odi Key, which was a, um, a thriving mill town out in the bay that was destroyed by the great 1896 hurricane, which swept through Cedar Key and, and did a lot of damage up and down the, uh, the eastern coast. Anyway, so what happens is that he had, he had, he had to, to, back to Muir, he had to go into recuperation for three months. And as soon as he got out of bed, he spent all of his time at the edge of the wood and the water. And he was transfixed by what he saw there, right? In that, in that intertidal zone, in that transformative, formless zone, especially by the birds. He calls them the feathered people. It was a complete revelation. It affected him deeply. You can see it in the surviving correspondence. And in a way, the kernel of everything Muir would do later was in that experience at the shore in Cedar Key confronting this uncertain mobile zone where he was thinking about how a certain kind of terrestrial world of vegetation and animals was merging with a, um, a flying world, the birds, but also a wading world and, a, and an estuary world. Um, he wrote a, a long chapter in his journal, um, wouldn't be published until late 1916, that I think is among the most extraordinary defenses of biological diversity and models of ecological thought, um, pretty much until the mid 20th century. Um, you'd think you're reading Arnie Nace on deep ecology and self-realization of species, or maybe Aldo Leopold on land ethic. It's like, the, it's like the primal scene of American environmental writing, right? It's got this subtle, witty critique of any notion of human exceptionalism, what we would call today speciesism. And it's got this, um, this, this, this vision of nature's object as 
making the happiness of each one creature more important than the happiness of only one, meaning, meaning humans. And there's this wonderful line. He says, the universe would be incomplete without man, but it would also be incomplete without the smallest transmicroscopic creature that dwells beyond our conceitful eyes and knowledge. And so those are two opposing views, if you will. There's the anxiety-laden view of the formless, the, the great masses that come in and threaten us with, with, um, with dangerous poisons and dangerous energies. And there's also the, the notion of the formless as, a, as a, a transitional zone that challenges hierarchies of species and hierarchies of land and water. I, I think the crucial thing about the coasts in both of those settings is that, that it's a space that refuses um, mastery and domination. One has to learn to move with its transformative effects, both in the physical world and the built landscape that humans sometimes place near it, but more importantly in the imaginative landscape, the way we parcel up the world into segments that make sense to us. It's a place where those essentially fall apart into ecstatic experiences of alterity. These seem to me the essential modern questions of the humanities. We often ask ourselves, what can the humanities do or what do the humanities do? Yeah. You're really answering what will the humanities do. I love this sense of the um, applied imagination, which is historical, but also has a vision of some kind of uh, liberation in the future. Yes. You're making me think a little bit also of Jeff Vandermeer, that great Florida yes. based writer who uh, looks at the fungal as a way of uh, recapturing. Yeah, yeah. Jeff's Jeff's work, of course. He um, we've had him here at UF a number of times for uh, this um, uh, this um, uh, initiative that I run called Imagining Climate Change. Here, we've had him come to speak. Um, Jeff's work is a very good example of something that takes place in these transitional intertidal and riverine zones, in which there's a, a, a liberation of imaginative potential sometimes felt as menace, other times felt as ecstatic liberation. And um, even in the examples that we see of, 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 of crisis in human contact with storm surges and flooding and destruction, there is still the potential to rethink, to topple and to dissolve the hierarchies of thinking that have uh, straightjacketed our ability to understand um, the, the generative qualities of that environment. And so Terry, in a future conversation, I'm going to talk with your colleagues about their work on the ground in the coast of Florida, the, the practical things they're doing with the, the people who live in those places in alliance and partnership with them. But it occurs to me that we all choose to work, and I think we're all grateful to work in public institutions. I believe in them very deeply myself. And so one of the communities of which you're a part is your communities with your students, with undergraduate and graduates. And I just wondered before we move along to Craig, and I appreciate so very much your iterations of these literary pasts, presents and futures. Just would you speak a little bit about a consortium like this can help teach us different perspectives from the rising generations of students and also allow students to speak with each other across places and institutions in ways that might be powerful to create new networks and collaborations and alliances in the future. Sure, uh, this is very important. Uh, teaching is perhaps the most important thing we do at the university. Uh, UF is, uh, we are officially a land, sea, and space grant uh, university. And so we talk a lot about the water. I have many fine colleagues who work in um, a range of disciplines devoted to coastal studies. I think it's important for students to start to think, particularly, as I said, in the late Anthropocene, the fringe of water and land is going to be not only among the most contested domains for human property, all the, all the, the, um, all the consequences of, of the, um, the virus of greed and capitalism that Melinda was talking about, that's going to be very, very important in Florida, particularly where those territories are very contested. But it's also um, a space from which, in, within which um, the coming generations of Florida citizens, many of them are my students, need to learn to adapt to the reality of rising waters and changing borders. Uh, they need to start thinking about the beach as someplace other than where you go to get a good tan um, and to get some fresh air. And, and when I talk to my students about um, this environment, I use it as an opportunity to rethink their relationship 
to the environment as not one of possession or domination or even um, a kind of vision of it as a standing reserve for exploitation, but to see it as, as one of the principal environments in this state, but it's generally true of all the places that our consortium is studying, one of the principal environments where our hubris as a species and a civilization is most challenged by the realities of biodiversity, by the realities of hydrological uh, energies and transformation. It's really the place to think in some ways most deeply about what the late Anthropocene means, not only for humans, but for every other living and immobile thing on the planet. Thank you, Terry. Now, Craig, thank you for being so patiently with us as we talk. And thank you, too, for being so encouraging from the beginning, because you've been involved in this kind of work that we aspire to for a long time, and populations that have been under pressure for a long time. And as Melinda said, we've already all learned a lot from the partnership with you and from with LSU. So I was just going to ask you kind of a foundational question, which is how you became interested in the coast as a site of study, because I think it would be an important um, journey for many of our listeners and friends to hear about. Uh, first, I want to say thanks to the other two speakers. I've really enjoyed their comments today, and thanks for including us uh, in this consortium as well. But, you know, it's, it's funny that I ended up doing work on coast because I'm an inlander, um, no relatives, no family connections to anything coastal. Uh, I came to LSU as an undergraduate for a while, and I discovered two things there while I was a student. One, I had a great appreciation for oysters, so <laughs> this was my first real uh, real taste uh, of the maritime, uh, or at least the coastal estuaries. Uh, and then uh, I, I did some work as an undergraduate uh, with the Coastal Studies Institute at LSU. I was just a little grunt undergraduate student, but I was digitizing old maps to trace the loss of land due coastal process. This was in 1973, 74. This was as the early efforts were still underway to kind of raise coastal land loss into the visibility of a broader public and policy makers. Um, many years later, I, I finished my graduate degrees, worked in land again for uh, nearly 20 years and came back to Louisiana uh, and wrote a book about New Orleans, but I saw New Orleans as an inland city. It was a river city. Uh, but Katrina in 2005 alerted me and many, many others that in fact, New Orleans is a coastal city and we have to think of it that way because this coastal storm, this hurricane uh, overwhelmed the hurricane protection system, dumped seawater into the city uh, and really caused the city to become uh, a maritime place, an actual maritime space for a brief period of time until it pumped all that salt water out. Uh, after that, I did a book on hurricane protection systems, so New Orleans as a coastal city was further reinforced. I spent some time in recent years working for a group called the Water Institute of the Gulf, uh, which was looking closely, working closely with the state on their coastal restoration program, still looking at coastal land loss as, a, as their official, the, Louisiana is the only state with an officially defined coastal crisis. We all have state birds and state <laughs> uh, songs and flags and everything. But Louisiana is the only state with an official crisis, and that is our land loss crisis. And uh, the, the state is emphasizing um, land loss and restoration efforts as biophysical and engineering challenges. They've done magnificent work in documenting this process, but they've largely forgotten people. And that's where I was brought in was to add some insight into how humans are involved in this, both in humans as scientists, humans as politicians, humans as people impacted uh, by this land loss, people dependent on natural resources in the coastal zone. So it was my job to begin reacquainting uh, the state officials and scientists with the fact that people are very present in this coastal zone. I can imagine that being a, a complex experience, both for the hydrology and the science involved, but also 
given the history of the Gulf states with the petrochemicals and industrial complex and the way in which different populations have been affected differently by the kinds of infrastructure that states have built around their rivers and waterways. And uh, I wondered, given our, one of our charges in the consortium is to help or for ourselves to take a responsibility to begin to build and amplify better partnerships with people. Just if you'd like to share with us, because you have this deep experience out of all of us, just lessons that perhaps you'd learned over the years about building such partnerships. Well, <laughs> I've done a number of projects where I've engaged with different communities. I did a, a, a considerable um, environmental history museum exhibit when I was work for the state of Illinois. We looked at the, uh, and we brought communities in. We did tons of oral histories and collected photographs and worked on exhibits, uh, working with uh, community groups. I'm typically an archival researcher, and I'm not particularly adept at dealing with communities. But I will say that one thing that has given me great, great satisfaction, when I come up for air out of the archives, when I put together my material, I, find no, I take no greater satisfaction than going out and talking to community groups. I've given hundreds of talks to community groups about my work and then listen to their feedback, listen to their comments, and they help me understand um, the failings of my work, where the next set of research questions are, uh, and in many cases, we find collaborators in those communities who can then help us do that. And that's, that's really the motivation behind this Atlas of Meaning, is to go into the communities and say, okay, look, you know, the USGS has been producing marvelous detailed maps for, for well over a century. What do they not put in? What would you like to see on maps? And I always point out the, the example that uh, this whole notion of food de deserts that's come about in the last 15 to 20 years was the product of participatory mapping, going into communities to say, what is missing in your community? What do we not understand about your community? And they said, we don't have grocery stores. Mm. And I'm trying to find those, those uh, places, those landscapes of meaning that are absent on the standard cartography. How can we complement? Those maps are all important and very useful, but how do we complement those maps uh, by uh, adding things like, um, you know, the, where are the, the places where uh, families get together? What are the, 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 the unmarked locations that are meaningful uh, in, in societies? And I think about the, there's an image that we see frequently here in Louisiana. There's, there's some burial crypts in the little town of Leeville, which is, and they're eroding away. They're separated from the main bulk of the community by an expanding eroding channel. And they're just eroding away. And yet these are culturally significant landmarks uh, that no one really knows who's there, but they have meaning. Uh, and and this, this Atlas of Meaning initiative is, is one way to try to get at what counts the communities that might not be easily counted by the scientists. And that's a, a term I borrowed, but it's, it, it, it has uh, real power in talking about the kinds of things we're trying to identify and um, collect and, and include in, in our work on this project. And you do it wonderfully. I mean, I think we all have, perhaps each of us has an imprint of what a southeastern coast or river community might look like. And I think the work that you have done there to amplify and broaden and diversify our understanding of those places is going to be very important as we go forward. I had a very interesting conversation last week with Ryan Emanuel, who Belinda had mentioned. And he was talking about his experience actually being on the water or in the water or by the water. And he's a water scientist and he was talking about being out in his canoe and going down these rivers and looking at the trees and the different experience he had of that of perhaps some of us who I was brought up by the ocean, by the water and a different sense of horizon and light. And Craig, before we bring everybody together for some final comments, I know you're an archivist and you're somebody who takes your work very seriously as an individual scholar and your engagement very seriously. But I wondered in all of those years of moving through those communities, like the one you mentioned where its burial ground has been separated, is there any image of the place really stuck in your head? I'm so taken also with Terry's cultural history of place through literature. 
I just wondered, was there a moment whenever you were traveling through these places or living in them or, or being with people that really stuck in your head as being significant as the way you kind of do this work? One thing I, 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 I've heard frequently, and it's, it's, it's almost a, an anthem that you hear over and over again in coastal Louisiana communities is, we're not moving. We will never move. We are rooted here. They can't make us leave. And I understand that deep attachment to place. That's one of the things that is important here. But at the same time, in part, I feel one of my missions is to help reacquaint people with the fact that every coastal society in Louisiana has survived by being mobile, by moving, maybe not long distances, but, but Leville, they abandoned Leville uh, and moved up, up the bayou uh, it, and actually, that was the second movement. People abandoned the little coastal community of Chenier Caminata. They moved to Leval in 1896. And then since they've moved up, up the bayou even further. So mobility, movement, is survival. It's adaptation to changing conditions. And uh, I would just like to reacquaint the coastal people with that fact and re re uh, remind them of that's part of their cultural DNA. That is That has enabled survival of the Acadians, of the Homa, of the Islanios. Every ethnic group in coastal Louisiana survived by, by movement. Uh, and it doesn't take, doesn't mean abandoning anything. It means simply moving to safety. Thank you, I think very wise words. Now, you've all been a wonderful part of this conversation, which I've enjoyed very much. And it reminds me why we put so much work in over the last two years to build this network and framework between us. And I, I wanted to leave you with a question that I hope you will speak to now, but also might think about as we go forward. And I will come back again to have more of these conversations as we do frequently amongst ourselves. We've talked about archives, we've talked about literature, we've talked about culture, and we've talked about deep attachment to place, even as those places change. I think over all of us, especially since we're all meeting here virtually, we can't meet in person due to the pandemic, so much seems uncertain. And Terry talked about that anxiety of the climate literature. I wondered if we thought of the consortium now as its own kind of archive, of its own collection of voices, of its own set of partnerships and alliances. What kind of trace would we like to leave for future generations? What can we do together now? that would be both a record or testament to the diversity of voices that experience these coastal places, but which also might, if not give hope, at least give a history to show that we were thinking about the tremendous complexity and difficulty of the moment that we face now. Would any of you like to speak to that? Um, yeah, I uh, well, I, I find that very moving. Uh, I really do find that moving, Nicholas. Um, one of the strengths of the consortium is the diversity of disciplines, the diversity of points of view, even of sort of national traditions that we're working in. To diversity in the narrow sense, the kind of institutional sense, um, diversity of methods. Um, I, I I think beyond that, there is also the sense that we are operating on different objects of study within the same constellation. Uh, some of us are doing work, field work, some of us are doing uh, strictly archival work, and some of us are doing literary work, and there's hydrological work. It, it's one of the great strengths of the consortium. But all of that effort, it seems to me, is looking historically backward, thinking about a history that got us to the point, but it's also looking historically forward. So I think, I think it's always the case that, that work like this leaves a legacy, but crucially, it seems to me that the fundamental legacy that we might leave is futurity itself, is that we're having a conversation about futures in which, as Craig pointed out, people will have to move from the water. Melinda pointed out um, contestation of who owns and controls the land at the shore. There'll be winners and losers of that. We know perhaps individually who we would like to win and who we would like to lose, but that contestation will continue for some time. And even though the futures that face us in this moment the moment of COVID, the moment of climate crisis, the moment of a profound wrenching debate within our nation of, uh, about racial injustice. The simple fact that we can talk about a future 
is a really crucial thing that we must do. We must talk about a future because simply talking about what may be is a way of establishing a continuity between the present and that future. And I find that with my students, young people that I work with, many of them despair that there will not be a future at all for them. And I tell them that, that, that um, cynicism and despair are the refuge of cowards. They have to think about futurity for its own sake before they can begin to act constructively to ensure that it's a future uh, worth saving. And I, I think the forward arc of our work is to some degree about looking toward um, the futures that approach us for their own sake in that we will affirm that there is a future, that there is a world coming for us. Craig or Melinda? Let me, I, go ahead, Melinda. Well, thanks, Craig. Uh, Terry, that was so compelling because it reminds me deeply, of course, of this question of indigenous futurities um, which is such a deep contrast and is surprising to people. The idea that we as indigenous people have a future and we're not just of the past. Um, and I think about your concept and, and it's it, in the applicable sense to my community, it is, um, you know, what my grandparents imagined for their futures that their descendants, grandchildren, great grandchildren, and on and on, would, would still be here and would be conceptualizing a future. Um, so, the legacy I think that I would hope we could um, leave behind would be, yes, that same sense of a future worth contemplating. The other, only other thing I would add is, is the power of sound and of songs. Um, and Nicholas has <laughs> knows as much about this as anybody else I know is, is the idea, the power that, that music and particularly voices singing carries with it to transmit knowledge and revolution, um, to transmit identity and to reimagine. And so I sometimes think about um, the physicist Richard Feynman's, you know, lecture, his series of lectures about the big idea um, where, you know, his big idea involved atoms and what they do to each other. <laughs> and I sort of, what would my big idea be? Or what would, what would my community's big idea want to be? And it would be that you're not alone. Mm -hmm. And the way that we know that we're not alone at, in my homeland is to sing together. So um, I think having a future worth imagining and remembering that we cannot accomplish that as individuals. Song is the thing that keeps that, um, that sense alive, I think. Thank you. Craig? Thank you, yes. Um, in terms of legacies, um, I think, I have been invited in at the last minute any number of times to participate in big grant related projects to be the humanist. You know, like a last minute add on, like, like a, 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 almost like a pimple, you know, <laughs> last minute addition. You know, something that's, that's tolerated, but you know, they don't know what to do with it. What I would like to see come out of this is, is, is you know, somehow that we begin to insert the humanities in the discussion um, and, and make it a, a, a feature part a foregrounded part of all discussions about how we deal with the coast and people. There's a big National Science Foundation initiative right now, uh, this calling for um, proposals on the coast and people that's supposed to include co-production of knowledge, which means community participation, not just stakeholder engagement, but real deep rooted humanities based co-production of knowledge and, and, and participatory knowledge. So I would like to see that we insert uh, at least in our universities, the humanities into these discussions about the coast and climate uh, and, and make sure it's, it's a prominent, equally based uh, component of research efforts. I couldn't think of a better way to end. You're all wonderful people. You've all become good friends, which is a 
I shouldn't say unexpected, but a, a pleasant and additional bonus of being involved in this collective together. <laughs> uh, it's nice that that uh, amity between us and that knowledge that we share and begin to create is something that's very much a product of this research enterprise. So I thank you all and be well. Thank you. Thank you.